Right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the AGM or the Structure Pension Fund. Uh, any of you who don't know me, I'm Councillor Malcolm Smith. I know he says it up there, and I'm pleased to see they spelled Malcolm Wright because they usually leave the other L out. <laughs> but it is pleasing to be here. Now, today you will hear from Justin Bridges. I think most of you know or recognise. Justin, uh, about the pension fund investment and how the fund invests. We're also fortunate to have Hannah Tobin and Richard Atterbury from Harbour Vest partners with us today. Now, Harbour Vest is one of the uh, team of uh, companies we use that look after our investments. And uh, can I say, as, as chairman, thank you very much. You've done a very good job. And it's nice to see you here, not on holiday. <laughs> you will also hear from James Walton, the fund scheme administrator, who will provide you with an update on the new pension board, which needs to be set up by the 1st of April 2015. You will have seen from the press and uh, the news media, the government and, and, uh, has been talking about altering pension needs and the way they operate and we fall into that category and so therefore they will be uh, explaining or endeavouring to explain as much about it as they can. We haven't placed individual copies of the slides on any, everyone's seats so if you haven't got one get friendly with your next door neighbour and ask if you can have a look at his copy or her copy. I must also tell you that certain parts of uh, today's proceedings uh, is being filmed and it will be available on our web website www.shropshirecountypensionfund.co.uk after the end of the meeting. After the presentations you will have the opportunity to ask questions and uh, there will also be members of the pension team available to answer any personal queries you may have on, one, on a one-to-one -one basis. Members of the pension committee are also here today and they will be happy to answer any questions you may have about the fund. I'm now going to hand over to Justin Bridges. Sorry Justin, now it's a brief. But I'm going to hand over to you who will give you an update on our investments. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Thank you Malcolm. Good morning, I'm uh, Justin Bridges, the Head of Treasury and Pensions at uh, Shropshire Council. I'm here today to give you an overview of the pension fund's investments over the last 12 months and the changes we've made in the last financial year. My first slide just gives a general <coughs> overview of the fund. The current value of the fund is 1.4 billion. And the membership of the fund now stands at over 39,000, which is an increase of over 2,300 from the previous year. The total number of employers within the fund has also increased from 109 to 126 over the last 12 months. Shropshire Council and Telford and Reakin Council are the two largest employers within the fund and represent 75% of the total fund. One of the main reasons for the increase in the number of employers last year was due to more schools converting to academy status. The fund continues to have two investment objectives. The primary objective is to aim for a fully funded scheme. In other words, to make sure we have enough money to meet our payments out to pensioners in future years. The second objective is to keep the employer's contribution rate as low and stable as possible. And the investment management arrangements of the fund are des designed to achieve both of these objectives. The local government pension scheme is a funded scheme. That means that your pensions are invested to fund future pensions. The Shropshire Fund invests in a range of diff different asset classes <coughs> and how the assets are split is the most important decision that the Pension Committee makes as this has the biggest impact on how the value of the fund grows over time. As at the 31st of March 2013, we adopted a split shown in this slide for diversification as not all investment types perform well at a particular time. You can see that we had 57% of the fund invested in equities, 25% in bonds, 10% in hedge funds, 
5% in property and 3% in infrastructure. All of the fund investments are managed externally. We appoint specialist investment managers to do this. And each investment manager is given a benchmark relating to the area in which they invest and they're asked to outperform this benchmark over a three year period. So who managed our investments at the start of the financial year? You can see here we use quite a number of managers, 15 in total. We choose investment managers with different investment styles for diversification. By investing in this way, we can achieve a higher investment returns for a given level of risk. Each of the managers shown specialises in investing in a particular asset class. And at the start of the financial year, we had a number of regional equity specialists, each managing different percentages of the 57% allocation to equities. Harper Vest Partners, for example, managed 5% of the fund in private equity. You will hear in a few moments from David about how the fund is invested in private equity all over the world. So what are the changes that we made last financial year? Well, in 2013-14, our investment advisor, Aon Hewitt, in conjunction with officers and members, carried out a review of the structure of the fund, and the recommendations following the review were implemented during the year. It was decided to move from regional equity managers, with the exception of our UK equity manager, into global equity managers. This will give our managers more freedom to invest globally in their best ideas, rather than being restricted to specific regions. We also increased the equity amount managed on a passive basis from 9% to 20%, which significantly reduced investment management fees. In addition, we replaced one of our hedge fund managers whose long-term performance had been disappointing. It is expected that all these changes will improve the overall return of the fund, maintain a similar level of risk within the fund, and also reduce investment management fees by £2.2 million per annum. As you can see from the chart now, the total number of managers has reduced from 15 to 12. The allocations to property, private equity and infrastructure remain the same. So does the 10% allocation to hedge funds, but, but this has now been split equally, with 5% given to our new manager, Brevin Howard. The allocation to bonds has also remained at 25%, but this is now managed by two managers instead of three with the previous 5% allocation to global government bonds being redeemed due to the historically low yields currently earned on global government bonds. The strategic asset allocation to equities remains at 57%, but this has now been split into active and passive managers. Majedi, who manage our UK equities, and MFS, who already managed global equities, have been maintained, and they each manage 8% of the fund. Investec Asset Management and Harris Associates have been appointed to re appoint the regional, uh, replace the regional equity managers. They also manage 8% each of the fund in global equities, which represents about £110 million. All these four managers are active managers, meaning that they set a performance target above a benchmark, and they aim to achieve that performance target. They all have different investment styles for diversification, and Investec and Harris have much more concentrated portfolios with between 35 to 60 stocks with their best ideas. Legal in general have been retained to manage 20% of the equity allocation on a passive basis. This represents about £280 million worth of the fund. Now, passive managers aim to track the uh, equity index and they hold all the stocks within that, that <coughs> index and produce returns in line with the index. The investment management fees for this style of management is a lot less. It is thought that over time the new split shown here is most likely to meet our investment objectives and maintain a high standard expected from Shropshire's investment managers. So how have our managers performed? Well, the yellow bars in the chart represent Shropshire's performance over the last six years compared to the blue bar, which is the benchmark. You can see that 2008-9 was a difficult year for the fund. The fund's investments fell by 21% that year, the global financial crisis impacting on investment returns. But you can see that the fund recovered strongly in 2009-10 and the fund increased in value by 32% that year, more than making up for the loss in the previous year. In each of the following years, the fund has continued to increase in value and has continued to outperform its benchmark. 
2012-13 was another good year for the fund, with the fund increasing in value by 14% and outperforming its benchmark by 2.3%. And last financial year, the fund continued to rise and increased by 9%, outperforming its benchmark by 3.3%. Now, pensions are a long-term investment, therefore we do not need to have a knee-jerk reaction to fall in markets. Some of our active members will not retire for another 30 to 40 years. So we have time to make investment returns, and as you can see, markets can improve quickly. You can see here how the fund's portfolios have performed. We don't expect all of our investment portfolios to perform well at a particular time, because managers perform well in different markets. But I wanted to show you this graph because it shows that 13 out of the 18 portfolios delivered positive returns last year. The managers which produced negative returns were two of our regional equity managers whose contracts have now been terminated, one of our hedge fund managers and two of our bond managers, one of which has now been replaced. You can see from the graph that we got the highest returns from our, from our investment in UK equities, which rose by 21.3% during the year. And positive returns were also experienced by eight of the ten other equity managers, with Japanese equities rising by 10.3%, global equities by 9.4% and private equity increasing by 8.1%. It is also reassuring that our infrastructure manager delivered a positive return of 9.6% last year. So how has this impact on the fund's value over the last year? Well, the fund continues to grow and increased in value by over 105 million last year to be valued at 1.34 billion at the 31st of March 2014. As mentioned earlier, the fund value is currently 1.4 billion, which is its highest ever level. So the fund has continued to, to grow since the end of the financial year. The fund outperformed its benchmark by 3.3% over the last year, and this outperformance generated an additional £40 million for the fund. The value of investments increased by 9% during the year. The fund has benefited from the continued recovery in the stock markets. <coughs> it has also benefited from the strong returns in UK equities, and these were the strongest performing asset class within the fund. <coughs> this slide details the issues that we're addressing over the next 12 months. So in conjunction with our investment advisor, Aon Hewitt, we are currently reviewing the strategic asset allocation of the fund with the Pensions Committee. Although we made a number of changes to our managers over the last 12 months, the percentage held in each asset class has remained the same. We have recently undertaken some asset and liability modelling exercises with the committee and are currently reviewing our investment strategy. We held a member training day in July and we continually hold member training sessions at quarterly pension committee meetings. The type of things being discussed at the moment are if the current allocations to bonds and equities are appropriate or if we should cover, consider other asset classes. We are also discussing with our, our advisor and our committee about the concept of introducing a flight plan. Now, a flight plan is an investment strategy that, that uh, changes as the funding level of the scheme changes. As mentioned earlier, the primary investment objective of the fund is to have a 100% funding level, meaning that we have enough assets to pay for our liabilities in the future. As the fund gets nearer to the target of 100%, lower investment rec returns can be targeted and therefore investment risk can be reduced. De-risking as the funding level improves helps to lock in improvements to funding levels. Within, within the flight plan, we set a series of triggers. And as the fund is currently in a deficit position, we currently hold high allocations to equity or growth assets within the fund in order to close the funding gap as equities are expected to outperform other asset classes over the long term. But as the funding level improves and the triggers within the flight plan are hit, this indicates that the allocation to growth assets should reduce, and the allocation to bonds, which are closely linked to inflation and more closely match our liabilities within, in the fund, should be increased. Now, a flight plan can increase the chances of our meeting our objectives faster with lower risk and greater certainty and provides a target and framework focused on the scheme's long-term goals and objectives. From the 1st of April 2015, the fund is also required to set up a new pensions board in addition to the existing pensions committee. 
This is something we'll be working on within the next few months and something that James Walton will cover more, in more detail in his presentation. My final slide is about ethical investment and understandably this is something that does concern people and is important to individuals. The Shropshire Fund has given a lot of thought to this issue over the years and we take this matter seriously. Shropshire Fund does not restrict the companies in which our managers can invest and some people ask why we don't exclude certain companies from investment. But the Fund has sought legal advice on this issue and our advice is that the overriding role of the committee is fiduciary. In other words, we must consider investment returns above everything else. <coughs> However, the Fund is still able to make a difference and it do does this by influencing companies from the inside. We use a company called F&C to actively engage with companies on our behalf. And last year, face-to-face -face meetings have been held with a wide range of companies to promote corporate social responsibility and high standards of corporate governance among the companies in which we invest. The Fund also believes that voting at annual meetings is important. The Shropshire Fund voted at over 400 global company meetings last year. By voting at these meetings, we are able to express our views on the level of board independence and pay contracts for senior executives, for example. The Fund is also a member of the Local Authority Pension Fund Forum. 60 other Local Authority Pension Funds are members of the Forum, which, which represents 75% of local government pension funds by value of assets. Now, this gives the Forum real bargaining power when it talks to companies and influence in the way they behave. Just to sum up then, the fund increased in value by over 105 million last year and 13 out of the 18 portfolios delivered positive returns and the fund outperformed its benchmark by 3.3% which <coughs> generated an additional £40 million pounds for the fund. I will now hand over to David from Harbour Vest to talk about the fund's private equity investments. Thank you. Good morning everybody, it's very nice to be here today. Um, my name is David Atterbury and I'm one of the managing directors within the London office of, of Harbour Vest. Um, I've got, I think I've got about 30 minutes to give you a little bit of an introduction to private equity. Uh, I'm going to talk through firstly a little bit of a background on Harbour Vest and then we're going to run through what is private equity. It's a, it's a <coughs> niche really within the investment market so we'll talk through that. I'm going to talk through how a private equity fund operates and then give you an overview of the, the investments that we manage on your behalf. So Harbourvest, we are a global, global private equity business. We've been in business now for over 30 years. Um, we have a, uh, a long-standing team spread across a number of offices, and um, we are exclusively focused on the private equity markets. What that means is we've been able to build a, a very long-term track record, and so when you put all of that together, we hope that that experience sees us through the ups and downs of, of the investing cycle and hopefully enables us to make much better informed investment decisions and then hopefully superior returns over the, over the long term. As you look at this slide here, you see a little bit of the, the scale of our business and the breadth of our business. So we, we started in Boston um, back in the, the late 70s. We've been investing across the US markets. We opened our office in London back in 1990. So we've been here for a long, a long time. As you can hear, I'm, I'm from the UK. Uh, and we have a very much a, a, an international office in London spread with a number of nationalities from across the European markets. We opened an office in Hong Kong back in 96 and then more recently we broadened the footprint to cover Beijing, to cover um, Tokyo and, and Bogota. So very much a, a global footprint servicing our clients uh, across the globe. In terms of um, our, our broader client base, we have a number of uh, other local authorities. We, we represent 23 local authorities across the, the UK. But we have a spread of clients globally. We, we very much invested in our team, um, both in terms of operations, investment professionals, and client service professionals. And then as you look at the types of clients that we represent, you can also see that somewhere around about two thirds of our clients are pension funds. And then having, having been in the business for a long time at the forefront of the, the industry driving returns for our clients, we've also had a position of leadership within the industry. So um, as a firm, for example, we were one of the, one of the signatories to the uh, UN Principles for Responsible Investment. And then with individuals within our firm, such as, as George Anson, who runs our London office, he's been chairman of the European Venture Capital Association for the last, uh, last couple of years. So very much at, at the forefront of the private equity industry. 
But with that, um, with that introduction to, to Harvest, let, let me dig into private equity in a little bit more detail. So there are uh, various names that you'll see there on the screen in terms of different types of alternative investments. Just to mention hedge funds, real estate, physical commodities. Um, where we sit is on the left-hand side of that page. So focused on the private equity asset class. And, and when you look below the, uh, the header there, you can see all sorts of different names that you may or may not, not have heard of. Um, lots of it jargon, venture capital, mares, distressed debt. What I'm gonna try and do is, is give you a little bit of an insight into, into where those come to play um, in the asset class and then, and then where Shropshire is, is invested. So what is, what is private equity? Well, it's, it's now a, a very sizable asset class and the objective is to deliver superior long-term returns through investments in private companies. And that's a very important distinction, private versus public. And, I, and I'm gonna come on to talk about that in a little, little bit more detail. Um, in terms of where we manage investments for you, um, the, the exposure for Shropshire is through the, the, the venture capital bar. And by venture capital, I mean investments in, in young, growing companies that often start with an idea and an entrepreneur. And then you're also invested in the buyout space. So this is um, more mature companies, brand names that you'll have heard about in the press, uh, where, the, where they, they change hands and a private equity investor takes over that company, invests in it for the, for the long term. So, so let's dig into that a little bit more detail. So the left-hand side of the page here, we've got some examples of, of venture capital companies. It starts, as I say, with an idea. So what we would call seed stage. So a, a, maybe a technology entrepreneur um, all of these businesses here have grown up over the last 10 years. They would have initially been funded to get their business off the ground with, with capital from a venture capital firm. As they grow over time, hopefully the revenues grow, those companies develop, and Shropshire has been invested in every single company that's on this page here at a very, somewhere along its, its life cycle and its trajectory in terms of its, its, its revenue growth. And so those, those companies grow, and when they get to a larger stage, they may well change hands, and at, and at that point, that's what we would call a, a buyout. So you can see the names on the right-hand side of the page here, so Hugo Boss or AA, for example, have all been owned or are owned today by private equity firms. And the idea, right the way across the piece there, is to grow those businesses, whether it be through the top line, and you can see that revenue growth uh, as businesses develop, or in terms of profitability, but ultimately grow the value of the business, and, and having invested on day one, maybe three, four, five years later, that private equity firm will sell the investment to another investor. That investor could be another financial investor, like another private equity firm. They could well list the business onto the stock market, so it could become listed on the, on the stock market in London or in the US. Or equally, they could sell it to another business, a, a trade buyer, a strategic buyer, so another business that's looking to expand into a new market. And at that point, when the business is sold, hopefully at that stage, the private equity firm will then create a gain, which then gets returned to investors. So that's how, that's how private equity managers make money. They invest at the beginning of a life cycle with a venture business or acquire a, a mature business, grow it over time, and then hopefully sell it for a gain somewhere down the line, probably three, four, five years later. Now maybe just to, um, to touch on the differences between the public equity markets and the private equity markets, so almost why, why private equity? Well, I mean, I'm sure everybody's aware of, of the nature of a, of a public market. You can pick up the phone to your broker, to an intermediary, and, and you can buy shares in a company that's listed on the stock market. So, that, so that's very liquid. You can, you can buy today, you can sell tomorrow. There's a ready-made market for your investment. What you'll find is that there's a, you have a certain amount of access to information. You can look at reports on the businesses, you can see the accounts, but actually it's, it's relatively limited. As people in the audience, you wouldn't be able to, to speak to the management team probably of that business and, and really get into the detail of the business. But there is some, some information, but it tends to be a passive investment strategy. Let's contrast that with private equity. So firstly, let, let, let's talk about the downside to private equity or the bigger risk in private equity. It, it's a liquid. If you're buying a single company from another investor, um, it is a, it is a, it's a two-way negotiation. You can't just come in on day one and buy. You can't place a, a buy order with a broker. There's a long period of negotiation. Maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months. Sometimes it goes on for several years before you actually agree the terms and come to an agreement on, on the transaction. So, so it is a long-term asset class. You can't readily sell your exposure. 
why would you why would you take that risk? Why would you lock yourself in in, in that way? Well, there are, there are various there are various positive characteristics to private equity. So so firstly, from an information perspective, you have much more information when you're making your your buy decision, when you're making your entry decision, when you're buying a company. You're able to meet the management team. You're able to spend time with them. You're able to commission third-party consultants to do due diligence for you. They can talk to customers. They can look at the market. They can look at what, what's happened in different markets overseas and draw comparisons. You have the benefit of accountants. You're able to send them into the business to do due diligence for you, to understand the financial statements, to dig into the next level. And so you have a lot of information when you're making your initial investment decision. But I think really the two, the two key aspects, though, are control and the fact that you can have an active strategy. So because you're buying usually the entire business, you get to control the strategy for the business. If you're investing in listed markets, even the largest public managers will maybe have two, three, four percent in a business. If you own the entire business, you set the agenda and the strategy. You can, you can choose your management team. If you don't think the management team is, is well positioned, maybe you can supplement them with new people. Maybe you can invest in certain areas of the business that the public markets don't give you time to invest in. And so you're able to take very much a hands-on view with the business, develop the business over time, and grow it. So you have very much an active strategy for the business. And when you put all that together, the no notion of better information on the way in, active control, um, uh, you, you hopefully generate superior returns over the long term. <coughs> I think the other, uh, the other interesting element of, of private equity is that you get to diversify beyond the public markets. We've got some, some pyramids here on the screen to illustrate what I mean by that. If you, we, we've used the US as an example. So if you look on the left-hand side there, what we've tried to do is capture the number of companies that are listed in the US on the US public stock markets. And then we've, we've ranked it by size of the company. So if the top left-hand side there, you've got 1,217 companies earning more than a billion dollars in revenue in the US. So very big companies. If you want to access that as an investor, that's fine. You can do that through the public markets. But as you, as you move down and look to invest in smaller companies, with less than $500 million of revenue, it's quite, it's quite tough to get a well-diversified portfolio in the public markets. If you look on the right-hand side there, if you compare and contrast with the private equity markets, private equity investors can go out and find smaller companies, engage with them on a private basis. And so you can see that you have the opportunity to invest in a very different part of the, of the marketplace with private equity. And how do you do that? Well, you need specialist private equity managers to be able to go and find those businesses and transact. So putting all that together, um, we come to returns for the industry and it's a very busy slide. So let me give you the punchline first and then we'll dig into the detail. So long-term historical performance for private equity exceeds the public markets. And if you get it right and invest with the very best private equity managers, those, those really in the, as we would call the top quartile, so the top 25% of returns, that outperformance can be significant. So just running through, let me, let me try and break this down for you. So across the top, we have the, the US markets, and across the bottom, we've got the European markets. And what we've done is compared, on a time basis, the returns between public equity markets and private equity markets. So the, the, the columns effectively, left-hand side, five-year returns, 10-year returns, 15-year returns, 20-year returns. And then if you look, let's, let's take an example um, for the top chart there. If you look at the 10-year returns, um, the dark blue and the light blue are two public equity benchmarks. So the, the uh, Dow Jones Index in the US and the S&P 500, so the equivalent of the FTSE here in London, effectively. You can see those returns over a 10-year period have been 9.1% and 7.7%. So if you invested your money in public equities, those are the returns you'd have generated over the last 10 years. The next column is the overall US private equity returns for 10 years, so 9.3%. So just on average, if you'd invested in private equity, you'd have had some level of outperformance. Not, not significant, um, but you'd have had some level. If you'd invested in the best 25% of private equity managers, you'd have had 20%. Double the returns for public equities. So you can see there, on average, outperformance, but really if you're getting the best managers, you really are getting significant outperformance and getting paid effectively for the illiquidity you have by having to lock up your money in companies for a long period of time. 
And you can see that trend is pretty consistent across the page um, once you get into very much the longer term, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So maybe just to, just to conclude on, the, on this section, so why invest in private equity? Well, it, it's very much that slide. Long term, historical outperformance over the public markets and the opportunity to diversify as well into other areas, smaller companies, mid-market companies, and very much spread your portfolio and access other areas of the, um, of the corporate world. Set against that, illiquidity. You are locked in to private equity investments for the long term and you have to stay with those businesses and see them grow over time. Having, uh, having hopefully given you a little bit of a flavor of, of what is private equity, um, the, way that, the way that an investor accesses private equity is through a private equity fund. And, and that's, a, that's another level of, of complexity. So what I'm going to try and do is, is explain how a private equity fund works. Now, private equity funds are typically pooled investment vehicles, um, and they're structured as a partnership. So what that means is that a private equity manager will come out and, and will raise money from a whole series of investors, and investors will, will club together, pool their, their commitments to that fund manager into a single vehicle that is called a limited partnership. The manager, the underlying private equity manager, will then go off and look for opportunities to invest that capital. And how that typically works is they'll have a three, four, five year period to build the portfolio. So as they identify opportunities to invest and they see an interesting company, they will invest in that company and the investors behind the private equity fund, such as yourselves, will then provide the capital to the fund manager to close the particular transaction. And then over a period of time, they'll build that portfolio. At the same time, they'll manage the existing investments that they have. And then the, once those investments are mature and have gone through their life cycle, they'll start to sell those investments. So you have a certain element of money being invested into the portfolio. And at the same time, once you get three, four, five years out, they'll begin to, to, to sell the underlying investments and money will start to come back from the portfolio. So you can see that takes a fairly long period of time and funds are typically structured with a 10 year life. So you can see, you see the long term nature of, of, of the asset class. The fund manager themselves is, is um, compensated through a management fee to, to cover the costs of running the business and, in, and employing the team. But the, uh, the, the key to private equity is very much alignment between the underlying investors and the private equity fund manager. And, and that is typically structured through a share of the, of the profits that the private equity fund makes, which is called carried interest. Now, if you, go, if you think back to the, um, the slide I, I showed previously with the, with the names on the page, some of those, a lot of those names will be recognizable to you. Um, the private equity firms are less well known. So, for example, Alliance Boots, or Boots as, as we all used to know it, is owned by a firm called KKR, um, which some of you may have seen in the press. Uh, they tend to be fairly low profile, um, and you hear about them from time to time on the financial pages. You don't hear about them that often in the press, though. Hugo Boss, it's owned by a firm called Premiera that has its roots here, here in London. Formula One is owned by a group called CBC. So names, names that are not really well known in the public space, but these are some of the best, best of breed private equity managers that are out there. So where does, where does Harbourvest come in? Um, well, our role is as a fund of funds. So we, we are here to try and find those very best managers for you, our, our client, and try and move you from getting the average private equity returns to getting those top quartile, those, those very best private equity returns and securing the outperformance for you. So we've got a, another, another complicated chart on here. And, and so we, we're the guys in the middle, we're the fund of funds. So on the left-hand side of the page are our investors. So Shropshire would, would sit on the left-hand side of the page and you would commit into our fund and then we will go out and assemble a portfolio of private equity managers for you. So as, as we make investments, we'll draw capital, and then as investments are realized, the money will flow back to you. But in terms of the underlying portfolio, if you look on the top right-hand side of the page, the first thing we do is we build what we would call a primary portfolio. And this is where our team will go out and they'll meet um, effectively all of the private equity managers out there on a global basis, depending on which part of the market we're investing capital in. And then we will try and choose those funds that are gonna be in that top quartile and deliver the outperformance. We'll also, as we're assembling the portfolio, 
look opportunistically for other, um, other areas of investment. And we will create at the bottom part of the page there a, a secondary portfolio. So sometimes within the asset class, investors decide that actually they can't wait 10 years to realize their money and they do need to get out of the asset class. And there is a secondary market for private equity. And so um, there will be on occasion that we will be able to buy pre-existing portfolios. And if those opportunities arise, we'll put that into the portfolio as well. And then at the very bottom, co-investment portfolio, from time to time, our managers will come to us and say, look, we're investing in a particular business. Would you be interested in investing in this one company alongside us? And we do that again on an opportunistic basis. But the core part of the portfolio is invested with individual managers in that primary portfolio. And then when you look one stage then further on to the right, I talked earlier on about how those managers build individual portfolios and in individual companies. Well, ultimately on a look through basis, you come through Harbourvest in the middle, we have the fund managers and then they've invested in an underlying portfolio of companies. And this is very important. You ultimately through your investments will have access to over 500 companies, probably up to 1,000, 2,000 companies, which means you have a very diversified portfolio. So if you, if you think about risk within private equity, a little bit of illiquidity, but also an individual fund can be quite concentrated. You may have 10 companies, but once you build a portfolio of funds, you have a lot of diversification within the portfolio, which helps to mitigate some of the risk that's inherent within the asset class. <clears throat> so how, how do our clients use us? Well. Um, it, it depends on the scale of the client. A lot of our local authority clients, and, and indeed Shropshire, use us as effectively an outsourced solution for private equity. So we look after all of the private equity, so we're the sole provider on the left-hand side of the page. But we work with a whole series of clients. Some of our more mature and, and longer-term and larger clients in the, U, in the US, for example, may well use us to help with their European private equity program or their Asian private equity program. So it very much depends as to where a fund of funds sits in, it's very much dependent on the, on the nature of, of the clients that we have. So hopefully having, having given you a flavor as well as how, how, fund work, how a fund works and how a fund of funds works, um, I've got some slides here now on the performance of um, the Shropshire um, portfolio and also a little bit of a look through as, as to what's contained within, within the portfolio and, and we'll link it back to the, the previous slides that I talked about. What you have on the, on the page here is a list of the commitments that we manage on your behalf. So you can see, um, so if you're totting it up, there are, there are 11 funds that you've invested in with us. It goes back a long period of time, back to 2001. So you have very much a mature portfolio in terms of those early commitments that you made with us. And they're invested across the private equity landscape. So from venture, you can see that the second line, the second row, fund seven venture, uh, a venture capital program in the US and through that program you would have had exposure to some of those names such as Google, eBay, Facebook um, and then you move down through the buyout programs both in the US, in Europe, in the, in the European program you'd have had exposure to, uh, to the AA, to Hugo Boss, to Birdseye etc that we had on the, on the screen. So through these funds that you have with us You've had exposure to all of those companies through their life cycle as they've grown and in many cases ultimately been, been sold. Um, so it's very much a, a long-term, well-diversified program that we manage on your behalf. If you put all that together, we've got some charts here that then shows what that looks like on, a, on an aggregated basis. So on the, on the left-hand side, um, with, the, with the chart that's labeled type, you can relate that back to how I was talking about portfolio construction. So your primary portfolio, where we've invested the money with individual fund managers to create the Fund of Funds program, it's about three quarters of the capital that we manage on, on your behalf. And then opportunistically, we've invested in some other mature portfolios in the secondary part of the program, and then a small amount into individual companies where an opportunity has, has, has arisen. So well diversified, but that's very much the, uh, the Fund of Funds construction. If you then look at the, the geography, you can see that it's fairly well balanced between the US and Europe, and, that, and that's really driven by some of your allocation decisions and, and the team's allocation decisions, investing into our, both our US programs and our Europe program, and then also our Asian and, and emerging markets program. You can see there with about 15% of the portfolio. And then lastly, on the right-hand side, uh, back at the beginning when we were talking about venture capital and, and buyout, it's very much weighted towards the buyouts within the marketplace. 
venture capital, as you would imagine, if you're investing in a business when it's just starting out, there, there is effectively, there's more risk attached to that part of the marketplace. And so the portfolio is weighted towards the more mature part of the market, the private equity uh, and, and the buyouts. Uh, but but uh, a split that's, that's probably in line with most institutional investors in terms, of the, in terms of the weighting between the two. And then when you put all that together, it's, it's around about, it's just under 100 million pounds of commitments that you've made to us. And this chart here tries to show how that all, all comes together. So um, on the left-hand side there, about 100 million of, of commitments. Now, if you remember earlier when I talked about how a portfolio is constructed, well, those underlying fund managers go off and they look for companies to invest in, and they invest in them over a three, four, five-year time horizon. So not all of your 100 million has been invested yet into underlying companies. So that's, that's happening, it happens over time. But of the 100 million, somewhere around 65 million has been invested to date. And then you also remember, you've been going now for 13 years. A lot of those companies that were invested in at the beginning of the program have been sold. And so you've had back distributions from the private equity fund. And so the bottom part, the 36 million on the bottom right hand side, those are the distributions, the cash that has been returned to, um, to, to you as in investors. And then the 59 is the value of the assets that are still held um, within the program. And so when you add that together, compare the 65, 66 to the 95, it shows there's a, there's a profit in there, there's a gain for you as investors of, of somewhere close to, to 30 million pounds across the program. And that gain will continue to grow over time as the 59 grows, as the companies that are in the portfolio today continue to mature, um, there'll be growth there. And then as the remainder of the 100 million is invested into new companies, they will also help to generate profits as well in the future. So that's very much how the model model hangs together. So maybe, maybe just to, to summarize and bring all that together, what I hope you'll take away is that private equity is very much it's a long-term asset class that, that should, will generate superior returns relative to the public markets through active management. But it is, a, it is an illiquid asset class, so there is risk attached to it. Um, and so you need to be accessing the very best managers to deliver the top quartile returns and capture the outperformance. And hopefully also what you'll take away is that Harbourvest with 30 years in the business can be your trusted partner affecting that, that process um, and hopefully believe that the, the returns will, will continue to grow from here. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to, to James. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is James Walton. I'm the uh, Head of Finance, Governance and Assurance at the uh, Shropshire Council and also the Scheme Administrator for the Shropshire County Pension Fund. So I'm going to speak for a, a few minutes now about um, the way in which the, uh, the, the pension fund uh, is governed, but also looking at some of the new requirements in relation to the, uh, the, the pension board, which, is, as mentioned earlier, uh, comes into, into place from the 1st of April 2015. Um, but first, I'm just going to give a short uh, overview of the last uh, financial year and all that we've been, uh, been up to within the pension fund. So. Uh, the slide gives an overview of what we've been, uh, what, what I'm going to be, to uh, going to be talking about now. Um, first of all, there's the uh, local government pension scheme uh, consultation. So this was um, this was a development. Uh, I talked about it uh, 12 months ago at the last uh, the last AGM, um, and at that point there was a call for evidence in relation to the the, the pension scheme. This then led on to a full consultation, which came out um, in May uh, of this financial year. Uh, the, the initial uh, call for evidence looked at a number of uh, high-level uh, objectives, uh, things around the way in which pension funds were put together, asset allocations, um, the way in which uh, fund managers were appointed, but also some secondary objectives, um, which was around reducing investment fees across those, uh, those fund managers uh, and looking at the way in which administration uh, is put together and how cost-effective those arrangements are. So May 14, uh, out came the consultation, um, and what was picked up as part of that was looking at the, the individual pension funds across the country uh, and identifying opportunities for things like uh, collective uh, investment vehicles for the way in which the funds uh, invest in the future, looking at passive and active uh, management uh, of, um, uh, of, of the funds of the, the, uh, the, the, the pension fund, looking at opportunities for collaboration between uh, different uh, pension schemes, 
Uh, and overall, the, the, the government estimated that uh, approximately £660 million pounds of savings could be delivered by looking at these, uh, these particular um, objectives. At the time of the consultation, it's still the case, um, mergers between pension funds is not being looked at um, directly, but um, I, I'm sure it's not completely off the, uh, off the agenda. So, it talked about £660 million pounds worth of uh, savings. Some of that came from uh, looking at fund-to-fund -fund arrangements and reducing the effective um, doubling up of, of, of fees on that. It's about £240 million potentially from that, but also another £420 uh, million came from switching towards passive uh, funding rather than active funding. So as has been discussed already uh, today, if you get active fund management correct, then the, the potential to outperform is great. But if you take the average performance on um, active and passive over the last 10 years, they're remarkably similar. But the point is, that's taking the average return. Uh, we feel that, um, or the, 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 the proof's in the pudding, Sh Shropshire County Pension Fund um, has performed above average and therefore is achieving a greater rate by having active um, management. Um, so we're working with that at the, uh, the moment. Uh, this time last year I also talked about the uh, actuarial uh, valuation, which was um, uh, from uh, March 2013. So. Uh, last year, I was I was talking about the, uh, the 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 way in which that's drawn up and, and what that really um, what, what that means, and it's the valuation, uh, it's the way in which the fund is valued in relation to the assets and the liabilities, um, and as of uh, March 2013, uh, the funding value was 76%. So 76% of the liabilities identified within the valuation were met by the investment income going forward that we could uh, expect. That was a fall from the previous uh, valuation, which was three years uh, before that, uh, which had a valuation of 81%. But following that valuation, and it is a single um, snapshot in time, uh, since that, the, the valuation of the pension fund has uh, increased, and it rose up to 86% um, at one point. In addition, um, the, uh, uh, the pension fund has uh, released its, uh, its annual report and set of accounts, which it does um, uh, every year. I'll come back to that in a, in a moment in a little bit more detail, um, but the annual report was produced uh, on time, was given an unqualified um, uh, audit opinion by Grant Thornton, our external auditors. Uh, there's only two opinions that you can get on accounts, qualified or unqualified, uh, and unqualified is the good one, so we, we, fortunately we got that. Um, uh, the, the accounts were considered by uh, the pension committee and agreed ahead of the, uh, the deadline, which was 30th of, of September. As um, was mentioned, um, by, by Justin earlier. We also undertook uh, quite a lot of, of member training this year. We've had specific away days, but also uh, training linked to each of the, um, the pension committees. Um, and again, as Justin mentioned, uh, we, we were looking at specific areas in relation to diversification uh, of the pension fund and also the idea of a, a flight plan going forward in relation to as the fund approaches or gets closer to 100% funding, how do you lock in those benefits and ensure that you don't then um, uh, slip away from that or how do you reduce the risk of, of slipping away from that? Um, and then finally, which I'll come on to in, in, in a moment, uh, the, uh, the, the, the requirement to set up a new pensions board. So this is um, over and above the pensions committee that we have uh, within, the, uh, within the authority. Um, and this is about improving um, the, uh, the, the governance around the, 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 uh, the pension fund. Um, so just to give um, a picture of the way in which the current governance um, structure is for the pensions committee. Uh, 20 years ago, back in 1994, the pe pensions committee um, was established and the committee itself has responsibility for all matters in relation to uh, the management and administration of the pension fund. It meets uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, the next meeting is on uh, Friday the 28th, so next Friday. Uh, it's a public meeting, so if any of you are free and you feel you'd like to come along, then please uh, please do. We don't tend to have many members of the public at the pension committee, and it'd be quite interesting to see some people there. Um, the, uh, the, the committee is set up uh, by the administering authority, Shropshire, County, uh, Shropshire Council is the administering authority and the chairman or the vice chairman um, on a rotating basis uh, of the pensions committee is a Shropshire Council uh, elected member so that we have that link uh, in there. Uh, the makeup of the committee, there's four um, Shropshire Council members 
and there's two Telford and Rekin uh, members who are co-opted onto that uh, committee. Uh, they are the largest employers within the fund uh, and they make up the six voting members uh, that we have within the pension committee. In addition to that, uh, there are two uh, employee reps and a pensioner rep um, as well. Uh, but those are uh, non-voting. So, um, main terms of reference of the Pensions Committee, so this is what's in place at the moment, um, and it is basically to provide advice uh, and to uh, approve a number of the decisions that need to be made at Pensions Committee level. So what are, what are the sort of things that the, the Pension Committee um, do? Uh, it, um, it, it, it makes decisions in relation to discretion for uh, admitting uh, organisations into the fund, so new employers that come into the fund where there's discretion, they, uh, they make that decision. They, uh, they make decisions around appointing uh, our external advisors, who our actuaries are, the external fund managers, so uh, the managers that you'll see over the years that come along, all appointed directly by uh, the, uh, the pension committee. Uh, they approve the formal valuation um, of the fund, and the committee itself takes its advice from external uh, advisors and the officers uh, within the uh, within the council that work towards the uh, to work for the pension fund. Um, they, the committee also determines the overall objectives, the general investment approach that's adopted, and so that strategic makeup of the of the fund. Um, that's a decision for the pensions committee, and also they monitor all of the investment transactions and the return and the performance of those um, fund managers. They also uh, approve some of the documentation, the government's documentation around this, which I'll come on to uh, in just a second. Things like the statement of investment principles, the funding strategy statement, and the communications policy uh, for the pension fund. So just to pick that up in a, in a little more, more detail, there is a lot of information, a lot of governance, good governance, um, around uh, the pension fund. So as I mentioned, we produce the annual report. This is much more than just the statement uh, of accounts. Uh, it lists all the, uh, the, employee, uh, the, the employers that are admitted into the fund, lists all the investment managers, so a lot of the information that, that uh, Justin was talking uh, about earlier, um, who the committee uh, members are, uh, the, the policies uh, that we work to, gives a review of the year, uh, the investment performance across the whole of the fund, um, as well as the actuary statement and the independent audit report that falls into that as well. We also produce the statement uh, of investment principles. So this sets out how assets um, are managed um, across, the, uh, across the, um, uh, the whole piece, what the return uh, on investments are, the expectation in relation to those, the strategic asset allocation, that split between how much goes into equities, how much goes into uh, property, etc., uh, and, in, and the investment advice that we're working towards. The funding strategy statement, um, this details all the assumptions in relation to the valuation and, and, and the way that the actuary um, uh, works towards this. It also identifies um, the pensions liabilities that we're looking to manage going forward and what our deficit recovery plan. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, as at that valuation, we have uh, we identified um, a deficit, um, and so the funding strategy statement identifies how we will deal uh, with that, and also the key responsibilities of not only the uh, administrative authority but also all the employers uh, that work within the um, within the fund. The communications policy, uh, as you expect, sets out how we uh, how we communicate. Um, and uh, with our membership with employers and the relationship that we have uh, with those. Um, the uh, governance uh, compliance statement, uh, that sets out the responsibilities of the pensions committee, uh, the representation on that committee, the way that's, ma that's made up, um, and also the terms of reference. The admin strategy, that sets out the standards that uh, we work to as, um, uh, as administering authority, but also the responsibilities of all the employers that fall within the, uh, within the fund. Uh, and on top of that, all the agenda and documentation that relates to um, the pension fund uh, are all available uh, on, the, uh, on the website uh, as listed there, uh, or as I mentioned earlier, you are free to come along to a, a pensions committee. So moving on in relation to the local pensions board, so all of that governance uh, is in place. Uh, every, everything is there set up and working on a, on a regular basis. Uh, the information is there, but um, as part of the work that uh, Lord uh, Hutton did in relation to his uh, independent uh, um, uh, committee that was set up, back in March 2011, uh, the result of that work 
uh, identified 27 um, specific recommendations, of which one recommendation, 17, was that um, each uh, local authority uh, pension fund should set itself up uh, a pensions board uh, with member uh, nominees uh, to, to push forward good standards uh, of governance, effective and efficient um, administration. The, uh, the Public Service Pensions Act in 2013 uh, put, put this into uh, legislation and the deadline is the 1st of April 2015 to actually um, have the, the uh, pensions board uh, up and running and in place. So at the moment, uh, consultation out is out on the, the regulations, the draft sets of regulations that have come through. Uh, the current um, uh, second draft is being consulted on at the moment and that ends um, very shortly. So what's the role of the, the, the pensions board? So this is to assist the council as administering authority um, in securing compliance with the uh, local government pension scheme regulations. It's securing compliance and uh, making sure that those requirements are, um, uh, any requirements imposed by the pensions regulator are met. It's about ensuring effective and efficient governance. Um, effectively, what the Pension Board does is it sits outside of the Pensions Committee and it provides an overview on all matters and all decisions that the Pensions Committee uh, is taking. It is not in itself a decision-making body, it just has an oversight um, view. So, uh, how is the, this Pensions Board going to be set up? Um, it will... Um, require a number of representatives and the way that we've uh, identified it uh, is as two uh, employer representatives and two scheme member representatives. There has to be an equal number. Um, there will be uh, an, uh, an, an appointment panel that's set up that then appoints these, uh, these members. And I'll come on to that in a, in a little bit more in, in, a, in a moment. But the appointment panel itself uh, will be uh, the Council Section 151 Officer, which is myself, uh, alongside the Monitoring Officer for the Council, which is uh, Claire Porter. So we will identify eligibility uh, criteria and a selection criteria. Uh, in terms of those, re those nominations for, for representation on the Board, um, each, uh, each employer uh, will be uh, able to nominate uh, up, to, up to one representative to represent the employers. Uh, and in terms of the scheme members, um, all active, deferred, and pension scheme members will be invited to submit um, applications. So there, there's 126 employers, 39,000 members. There's a big pool there to, to pull, um, hopefully, four members uh, out of that uh, to serve on the pensions board. But um, we do need to think about um, the, 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 the capacity and the, the, uh, the level of knowledge and experience that's going to be required in relation to that, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, the Pensions Board, the term of office for the members will be uh, four years, potential for an extension two years uh, beyond that, uh, and reappointment would be permitted. Uh, the Board, as it stands at the moment, we're expecting to meet uh, a couple of times a year. So, to um, summarise that in a little bit more um, of a, t a timeline, the first stage in setting up the pension board was developing uh, terms of reference. So we met with advisors, we um, identified and developed some uh, terms of reference. We set up a task and finish group, which was um, included the, the, the chair or the vice chair, uh, as is now, of the pensions committee. And we uh, pulled together some terms of reference and reported that back to the uh, pensions committee. The second stage is that we'll have to take uh, the creation of the pension board through to Shropshire Council's full council meeting. Uh, the next one is on the 18th of December, so a report will be going there, which will allow the pension board uh, to be set up. The next stages are um, uh, may take a little bit longer, uh, simply because we're still waiting for those draft regulations to become finalised, which will give us the detail around the way in which they, the, the, the board will actually uh, manage and, and, and be governed. So there may be um, a slight delay in the nominations. We're working at the moment to <coughs> February, March to get those uh, nominations uh, in. Um, and we've already written out to, uh, to all the employers and there has been some interest uh, shown from uh, certain employers in relation to putting a nomination forward onto the, onto the board. Um, 
in terms of uh, in, in, uh, uh, members, uh, there's the annual benefit statement, which mentions this. There's the In Touch magazine, uh, which has gone out. There's the website. Um, and um, there's, there's uh, a, a, a number of different areas that we'll be pushing over the next few uh, months to try and bring in uh, some nominees. The closing date is likely to be February, uh, March, um, and then it will be a case of setting up training to get the, those, those um, appointed members uh, up to speed in relation to what they can do, what they can't do, what they need to do, what they need to, uh, what they need to know. All that will be undertaken before the board is formally um, set up. Um, and then you get to the, to the, the last stage in terms of stage five, uh, where we'll then be starting to set what would a typical agenda be, what would typical documentation be going to that, uh, that board. We have to get the board set up by the 1st of April, but in terms of the business that starts to throw, flow through that, that may take um, a little longer. So, um, all that I've talked about so far has been around that governance arrangements uh, around the pension fund. So we've got um, a, a diagram at the moment. This shows the, uh, it says future, but this is at the moment, this is just the current governance structure that is around the pension fund. So you've got the block in the middle, um, which is the pension fund administered by Shropshire Council with its 126 um, employers and the 39,000 scheme members. And at the moment, the um, uh, Regulations and guidance flow down from the uh, Department of Communities and Local Government in the top uh, left. So that is the government department that, that looks after pension schemes um, and all of the say, regulations, all of the guidance flows directly uh, from them. In addition to that, we have the Local Government Association. So these, this association um, acts uh, on the employer's behalf, makes representation through to, uh, to the uh, Department of Local Government, but also provides um, technical uh, guidance, a little bit more t uh, guidance in relation to the way in which the fund works. And as already mentioned on the right-hand side, we also have uh, the Pensions Committee, which is the decision maker for um, uh, the pension fund. So all that governance is, is, is in place. Moving forward with the introduction of the pension um, uh, board, further governance will be placed around it, extra security. Um, on the left hand side you have the scheme advisory board. Um, at the moment this exists as a shadow um, advisory board. Again, this was set up uh, as a recommendation from uh, Lord Hutton's um, uh, uh, work. And this, at the moment, this, this uh, is, is, you can look at the website at the Scheme Advisory Board. Uh, they provide a lot of national information. It's a one-stop one shop to be able to get that overall picture of the way in which all of these independent and individual uh, local government pension funds uh, are, all, are all working. Uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, the first annual report was produced of the, the Scheme Advisory Board, the Shadow Scheme. Um, they, going forward from the 1st of April, will move from a shadow status into becoming a scheme uh, advisory board, and they will provide advice directly through to um, the DCLG, but also through to um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the pension fund. We also have uh, the pensions uh, regulator. These are, the, these are the UK regulator for all pensions, uh, for work-based pension schemes, um, and they will provide uh, additional and specific guidance uh, and provide an overview into the pension fund. Um, they're, spent, they're, they're sponsored by a separate government department, Department of Work and Pensions, and that provides that link in there. And then finally, in the bottom <coughs> right, the new pensions board will be in place as well, which, as I said, provides an overview to the pensions committee, but also to the actual pension fund itself. In itself, no decision making, but it's about making sure that the decision making that is undertaken and all of that advice uh, and governance uh, out there is dealt with um, appropriately. So, finally, uh, uh, what happens next? Well, as I say, we're awaiting the final regulations. Um, they should be out sometime, hopefully before Christmas, may go into, uh, into the next uh, calendar year. We're looking for nominations from uh, individuals. Employers have been contacted. Um, in Touch uh, magazine has informed uh, pensioners and details were sent out to all employers through the annual benefit statement. There will be an application form available um, on the site from, um, on the website from January uh, 15, and then will be uh, undergoing that appointment process, 
careful consideration that individuals have the capacity, knowledge uh, and skills to be able uh, to undertake, uh, undertake the role. Um, we'll go to that appointment panel, we'll have the, um, the individuals in place um, and then uh, we should be able to be up and running by 1st of April 2015. So further details of all of that will be available on the website. So that wraps it up for me. Um, hopefully that's been of interest to you, but if nothing else, hopefully it gives you an idea of the, the governance that is uh, surrounding the pension fund, making sure that what is a significant amount of, of money is managed and governed um, absolutely correctly. So I will now hand you over to Debbie. Thank you, James. Um, Becky was, uh, just wanted me to bring to everybody's attention the fact that uh, we are being filmed, which Malcolm said, but that means we go on YouTube. People can look, look at us while we're doing this presentation for you, so it's to cover people who can't make it to this meeting. But what she did ask me was that, was there any way that we can actually increase our hits? One suggestion was I could trip over coming up here, so I got over that okay. But watching some of the presenta uh, presenters uh, coming up, I did think actually the pensions team could have done a bit of a shadow <laughs> presentation behind the board there. So I uh, took my opportunity to come forwards in case I started sort of giving you a bit of a display in the back. So I'm here to give you an update on all of these changes. What have we been uh, doing this year to keep my team busy? It's been a busy year. It's, not, it's been more than a busy year. I've been in pensions now for over 20 years and it hasn't stopped. Every time you think you've got your new scheme, every time we think we've got new governance, every time we've done something new, then all of a sudden the government <coughs> decides, actually, let's do something else with pensions. So in the last year, we've had changes to the governance requirements. So we're going to touch just on what does that mean for my team. Looking at the pensions regulator, they've had a draft code of practice out. What's that going to mean to us? Looking at the data quality, what are our employers having to do? We've got employers in the, in the, the, the members in the meeting today. What's a care scheme mean for the act active members that are in the scheme? How has it changed for them? What are we doing to actually communicate it with them? Freedom and choice. In the budget earlier this year, yet more pension changes were introduced. Chancellor decided let's give people more freedom and choice. But what does that actually mean for our pension fund? And then how have we been communicating this to keep you all informed of what's changing, what's going on um, in your benefits? It's your scheme at the end of the day. So what's changing regarding our governance? James has given you a really good overview there of the actual structure. What are we actually having to look at? But because the pensions regulator role is being increased, then that just means we've got somebody else looking and ensuring that we're doing what we should be doing for our membership and with our fund. We putting on a talk, so for the employers that are in the audience today, we have advertised and will be advertising the next training session, and that's going to include a talk from the pensions regulator. The, the new draft code of practice that they're going to be put out won't just you know, apply to us as the pension fund, it will actually apply to employers as well. So it's letting them know what we've got to do. What does that affect record keeping? At the end of the day, the only way James actually knows that his liabilities have been accurately assessed in the valuation is if they can actually get a determination that the record keeping is good. Have we got good data? The pensions regulator will actually be able to put fines. Uh, he'll be able to fine employers. They have already started fining employers over auto enrolment. So that was another sort of pensions policy introduced by the government auto enrolling members, the county councils that are in our pension scheme have hit their staging dates. Some of our smaller employers are still yet to stage. That just meant that the legislation hit the employers and its members, if they hit certain criteria, have to be put into the pension scheme that they offer. So it's just added sort of layer of complexity. Employers need to be aware of who's, who's watching them. What do they have to actually have in place? We're expecting guidance. We've got draft out at the moment, so we'll wait and see. Um, that should come later in the year or in the early next year. Um, and of course, there's going to have to be increased reporting to the board and the committee. As a fund, we've had good governance up to now. You saw James's slide where he showed we've had a pensions committee. Administration have actually reported to that committee for many years. Not many funds actually do that. Some funds don't even actually have a separate pensions committee, so they've got bigger changes to catch up with the governance. 
Um, but we haven't. We've already been doing that. We report. If you ever go online and look at our committee reports, all the public reports are there for anybody to see. Um, and James has invited you all to our pensions committee. So for next pensions committee, we actually hope to see the room full, don't we, James? <laughs> Um, but even if you can't make it to committee, reports are there, so you can just watch on the council's website. Um, and there's a link on our website as well that goes through to it. So pensionators, regulators, their code of practice. Um, I'm not quite sure whether I think it's going to be a thorny rose or a nice rose, but for us it's growing. So this is what this is meant to represent. I thought it was, you know, throw in a few pictures for you to look at rather than just death by PowerPoint. But... It is going to have to encompass everything that's around the outside. We've got the pensionators, the pension regulators code of practice coming, but there's the Public Service Pensions Act. So we've got rules and regulations laid down in that we've got to follow. We've got fund employers to consider. They've got to adhere to the regulations. They might have to adhere to the, you know, the practice guidance as well. Scheme advisory board requ requirements, James mentioned, they will be putting down advice guidance coming our way as well. Local pension boards, we, they, they've got to know what it is in all of these guidance. Everything has got to try and be pulled together, including looking at, at, at the basics, what is actually in our fund administration regulations. So the regulators code of practice has got to ensure that it encompasses everything that sort of we're already having to adhere to anyway. The consultation has closed on that. Um, and as I said, expect more by the end of this year or into the new year. Data quality and employers, we, we sort of stand here each year and talk about what the scheme rules say, what we're doing for you, but we can't do that without your employers making sure that they've actually captured the right data for us and told us what they're doing with your pay. Are people in the pension scheme? Are they not in the pension scheme? So preempting what's happening sort of next year coming in with with more of the governance what we've tried to do is work with our employers this year to get capture more data electronically the more manual intervention you have in in a process then you open yourself up to a bit more risk it it, it can be manipulated it could be changed so what we're trying to do is is get that data flowing from one system to another um, technology's come on a huge, you know, huge leaps and bounds. I started in the pension fund and we did have a computer then, but it was just a dumb terminal. We still filled out forms and sent it down to the IT department. Um, we don't have to do that nowadays, but actually why should we still manually take um, a report from one system and then try and put it into another one? We're trying to get them to talk. So we have actually looked at using a little service and we've contracted with iConnect that does this for us so it sort of flies through the ether i'm not very technically minded i i do now have a mobile phone that's on a contract that was a big step forward for me um, so i have a good team behind me who are actually looking at doing this for us but what we hope that's going to do is actually be better for the employer for the fund and for the members our data will be more robust we will hopefully add to our governance um, and not put ourselves at risk of being fined for anything it just means that we can capture that and have a good audit trail of where we get our information from. So data quality is all about improving. You may be surprised our employers are never surprised <coughs> because um, we do have to spam them a lot, I think, with their emails nowadays of reminding them what uh, they need to give us, what, uh, what's changed. But you'll see here what they have to actually give us. It's not just telling us somebody's in the pension scheme. There's lots of information that affects someone's benefits. There's, um, they have to remember to tell us all of the instances here on the left of the chart. And then there are also year-end returns, monthly returns on top of that. <coughs> They've got people who are paying AVCs to Prudential. It's not just to us. There's lots of things that are going on for employers that they have to make sure that <coughs> we know all about. We have to ensure that that governance is there. Are we getting the right data? Nowadays, with the new scheme coming in, and I will be going on to that, it, it's not just one scheme now. We've got a 50-50 version, so we need to know where people move from 50-50 to the full scheme, where they go back again. There's lots of added complications for employers. Employers now have to keep records in the new scheme, pensionable pay change, the description change for individuals. But because we've got protections, they also need to tell us what if that person actually gets paid something now that's captured under the new description, but wasn't captured under the old description. We have to have both sets of 
pay because we're going to need, to need it to calculate out the benefits. <coughs> Our employers, and for employers in, in, the, in the room, we occasionally have issues, but I can, um, well, I just want to thank them that our issues are far fewer than a lot of other funds around the, count, uh, around the country. Um, we work, well, we feel we work well with our employers. Hopefully they feel the same, but we do get good data. Occasionally there might be a blip, but overall um, they usually engage with us and that makes sure that our data is robust. So, we have got a new LGPS. Uh, it's still the local government pension scheme, but we've now just got the 2014 <coughs> sets of rules as well. Basically, and we covered this last year, career average scheme now, it's not based on, uh, for service from April 2014, members are getting a career average pot. Each year they buy a pension on the salary based at a 149th, so it's a better accrual rate. I always think, think of your cake, if you cut it into 60 pieces, you wouldn't get quite a big as piece as if you only cut it into 49. So that just shows that they, they, it gets a better proportion of their pay is going into their pension. But it's captured each year and then it's inflation proofed, whereas before we used to have just service based on salary at retirement. So you never actually knew what your pension was possibly going to be because you might get a nice promotion beforehand. Um, you only knew closer to retirement exactly what your pension was going to be. Whereas members now know they capture it each year and then we'll just tell them what it's increasing by inflation. Greater flexibility. Um, our members can now actually go from 55 without their employer's consent. They will suffer a reduction to their benefits, but that's not a penalty, it's just because their benefits have been paid for a longer period. So they're all actuarially assessed based on average life expectancy, but it's a choice, so there's greater choice there for our members. Or they can work beyond, they can go up to 75. If you work beyond your normal pension age, you, your benefits are um, increased to take account of that. So as well as greater accrual, because you, you could add up to another sort of 10 years onto your uh, pension, the pension you're not taking gets increased to take account of that. Just a bit of extra flexibility. <coughs> not everybody's ready to finish at uh, 65. Um, but normal pension age is now going to be linked to state pension age. So people for service from April 2014 don't have a lockdown <coughs> date of payment because if the government decide to change the retirement ages and push them even further out, our, our pension scheme is now linked to that. So we haven't got a slight guarantee there. So the closer we get to retirement, the more we know, yes, our, what our benefit is going to be and when it's actually going to be paid from. All information was provided to our members. Most of the changes affected active members. So we sent out a newsletter to everybody, it was delivered to the home address we hold. So for any active members in the scheme, make sure you keep that up to date. Um, because we will still use it on occasions to ensure anything that's very important. We need to know that it gets delivered until we've captured more electronic information from everybody. And anything that changed for our deferred members or our pensioners was sent out in a newsletter. So hopefully everybody is up to date with where they are with what this change has brought. For any active members, there were some protections. As has usually happened in the local government, if you've had a pen pensions promise, it's very difficult to take that away from you. So there are some protections that uh, membership up to 2014 is still based on final pay, which goes back to why the employers have a more difficult job now. They need to keep that description on their systems and they need to tell us what the final pay was for somebody. Um, protected normal pension age for that uh, membership, that's still 65. For some people, it could be earlier than 65 down to the old 85 year rule. Most, most people know that little sentence, but so some people still have a bit of a protected um, earlier retirement age. There is an underpin because when the Public Sector Pensions Act was announced and they were talking about changing the public sector pension, so this hasn't just, well, it's ha only happened in the local government pension scheme this year, but next year, all of the public sector pension schemes are changing. Um, and at that point in time, it was announced that back in 2012, anybody who was within 10 years of retirement would have an underpin that if their new scheme didn't give them the same benefit as their old scheme would have done, they get what they were promised in the old scheme. So we've also got to look at that underpin for anybody who's in that age group. Um, and final pay protections, that if anybody has a reduction in pay going forward, in the new care scheme, that won't necessarily 
affect them because you're just getting your benefit captured in that one year. But for in the final salary pension scheme, of course, all of your past service is going to be based on your future pay. If you take a pay reduction, that will mean that all of your benefits are then taking a reduction as well. So they've got protection that they can still keep um, within 10 years of that change if they retire. It won't affect them. This is just a, a quick calculation. We haven't seen Liz Hurley recently, so uh, you know, six years ago she joined our scheme. Um, but just to show you, there's too much information on there for you to have a look in, but what we've captured is if someone was in our pension scheme for sort of 30 years, their benefits are now, young Liz here has three years pre-2008, which was the last time we had our most recent change. She's got six years between 2008 and 2014, and then she's going to stay with us for another 21 years in the new care scheme, up to when she's seeing that she wants to finish at 65. But what the team have got to capture for her is she's going to have three different sets of benefits that we need to calculate differently, and then add them all in, in together. And you'll see the first two sets under the final salary scheme She's got no reduction if she wants to retire at 65 because that was her retirement age. But if she's taking it at 65, the years that she's had in the care scheme will actually suffer a reduction because she's having those two years early. You have to take your benefits together. These aren't separate pots. It is one benefit. It's just made up of different calculations. So um, for in her case, we add those all together and then she's given a, a pension that comes out of it. And you'll see there, Again, lump sum looks very low because people were used to having in the pre-2008 scheme, of course, you had a pension and a lump sum. It's not automatic lump sum anymore, better accrual rate, but it's all going into pension. So what Liz will need to do is decide if she wants to increase that lump sum at retirement, she can do, um, but she'll have some decisions to make. And we've got to capture this now, so for any active members in the audience, your annual benefit statement from next year is going to start to look different because we've got to try and give you broken down exactly which parts of your benefits are in the final salary scheme and which ones are in the care scheme. And you need to be looking at your benefit statement because it's down to what your employers have told us. And most of the time we trust them. If we see it, we do do checks and balances, so anything drastically different, we would check, check up on, but we may not capture everything. So it's gonna be really important for people to look at their own benefits. Thinking of retiring, um, we just wanted to point out some, some general points to note that you can go now from age 55, but if that's before your normal pension age, of course, you're suffering those reductions. So make sure you come to us, check what the reduction is. It's all on the website. Um, you can self-serve, you can look at uh, modelers, you can do your own calculations. If you need any further help, you can always check with us. Flexible retirement, ill health, redundancy is still all dealt with by employers. So you can't just decide you want to go on an ill health retirement yourself and resign and expect to get one. Don't. You've got to do it with your employer. Final pay. Until that's known, and remember we're now in a career average, so we need to know the actual pay you've had. When we were final salary, you were on, most people were on a salary. Your employer knew what they were going to be paying you. Um, with a, uh, the career average now, we have to know what pay has actually be, been paid. It's not just a formula. Um, so until we've had that final salary, we cannot do your final benefits. So the big message is don't expect your payment sort of the day that you're always your first day of retirement, which we have prided ourselves on that where we could work with employers in the past and where we could do that, we've wanted to do that for membership but we're not going to get the information as quick from employers now because they have to wait and see what they've paid you in that last month so as we can capture that for the care benefit. So don't expect it too quick. You still have an expectation from us. We still want to do it within a good time frame, but just bear with us. Don't go and buy your Lamborghini that you need to pay for the first day of your retirement. Your money may not be in the bank. Please don't do that. Um, but for anybody who is thinking of retiring, we still pay. Pensions are paid on the 29th of the month. That's a bit different to some of the employers, so just know what to expect. And your lump sum, we promise to do it as soon as we actually can. Anybody looking to retire, a bit of planning here. Actually, can you afford to retire? Check your annual benefit statement. Get to know what benefits you've actually got in the pension scheme. And look at all of the information that's out there about what you could do to top it up. Um, we run... Uh, 
drop-in sessions through the year, which, which we usually have um, Pru app, which is our AVC provider. People need to have a look at what, um, what do they need to do, what's their decisions, can they afford to retire, get to know what you're going to actually have. And another thing is authorised absences now, um, if anybody's currently working, if you have an authorised absence, you only have 30 days to make your election to ensure that your employer covers that absence with you. If you don't act within 30 days, you have to cover the whole cost yourself. So we're trying to get that message out as well. So that covers maternities, um, authorised leave. Uh, things like unauthorised leave, someone just not turning up or going on strike. No, you have to pay for that all yourself. But if it's an authorised absence, don't wait to make your decision because you'll find it costs you a lot more. Freedom and choice, big, lots in the press about this, lots on the news. It's more for defined contributions though. It's not at the moment targeted heavily for our type of scheme, which is defined benefit scheme. It did increase some of the limits for us that people with small pots of pension have greater um, choice to actually take it as a lump sum uh, and, to, and pay a bit of tax on that. But at the moment, just from the bottom, the watch this space because the government is looking that actually schemes like ours, should we actually be looking to offer more flexibility of how people can take their benefits. We do have a bit of flexibility, but they're looking to say, should they actually loosen up our regulations yet again? So we'll watch that anyway. And I've mentioned about the minimum pension age. What we've got to watch though, is that because of freedom and choice and you can, from a personal pension, you can just take a pot out and just pay the tax on it, that we're hoping people don't actually just want to transfer their money out of our scheme because you will lose out on doing that. Um, it's interesting to note that all the other public sector schemes, because they're not funded, you've just heard about what's in our fund, what are we doing with that money, um, the Treasury has decided that actually we've got money so we can pay a transfer out for people, so they could transfer from us to a personal pension to get hold of all of their cash. Um, but it's, it's going to be banned from other public sector schemes, so they will not be allowing um, the transfers out because they don't have the money. So if they allowed the transfers out and someone wanted to put the capital value into a personal pension, it's going to have to come from Treasury, so they're going to have to find the money from the taxpayers. So they're banning transfers out to personal pensions um, from the other public sector schemes. Nearly at the end now, communication, lots of electronic communication. We are trying to go more electronic. That's to save money, make things quicker, ensure that people have the information at their fingertips if they want it. Um, member self-serve means for active members, you can go in, you can have a look at your benefits um, building up. Maybe more interesting to people now we're in the care scheme because they'll actually be able to see what's their uh, employer giving us and what they're telling us the pay that they're receiving. You can match up the two, have a look at it. Um, We've joined up with Gov Delivery, new one. We're um, spamming you now, so please make sure that you set your computer, if you get computer, that we don't go in your trash. It's usually interesting that we send you. Read it, have a look at it, but we're trialling that as well, just to try and make sure people are more interested and know when things are changing. So just trying to be a bit more um, up to date, really. And pensions online, are you registered? You can all look at your pay slips online. You can look at information for pensioners, so it's, it's interesting. Go on our website, see what's there to have a look at. Um, and we're updating our forms, our guidance, employers, we're working with employers. Uh, I like the picture in the bottom. Employers, we have all of this information. We have to also put it onto your employers. They've got to pay you, they've got to look after you, but they've got to also know what's going on in pensions. So we've run two training sessions. We've got our next one after Christmas, so for next year. Um, and all our scheme updates are always as up-to-date as we can possibly make them on the website, so please have a look. We've got feedback sheets out there, so we'd be interested for anybody to come. We've only run the one meeting today. Um, we, we still did two last year, one over at Telford and one at here, but we didn't have a great take-up, so we made the decision to have one main meeting. Um, it being filmed, so people to look at it online, so any feedback on speakers, venue, time of day, whether you like this meeting still, please, please put that on the feedback sheets. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming and please do stop for a coffee and anybody, usually on my team, we'll have a blue lanyard and if you've got any personal questions, um, please just find us outside. But I'll now hand back to Malcolm Smith for any questions from the audience. Thank you. It's now your turn. If you have got any burning questions, although 
the presentation itself, I must say, is very comprehensive. But if you have any questions, please address them through me. And uh, one of the speakers here who has been addressing you will endeavour to answer it. Have we any? Gentlemen, then. Thank you. Uh, you Would you give your uh, name before you say okay. it? Sabah Shamash. Uh, you, you mentioned that it goes up and down over the years. Uh, the question is, have you got a graph which shows the uh, achieving the 100% uh, depending on, on uh, returns on, of the fund at different levels, like 3%, 5%, maybe 7 or 9%. Do you have that information? We can, we can get that information for you. I haven't got it. Well, I'm, I don't want this personally, but I mean, I'm just wondering if, uh, if, if you have any idea how many more years it will need to achieve the 100% funding, <coughs> assuming, say, uh, a return of 3, 5, 7, or 9%. Yeah. It, it changes all the time. As yes. I mentioned in my presentation, we've done some asset liability modelling with our pensions committee. And at the time, um, at the 2013 valuation, the funding level was 76%. Then that did increase to 86%. And as part of the modelling exercise we did, we looked at different um, forecasts for returns going forward, expectations for inflation and things like that. Um, a, getting back up to that 100% funding level was within the sort of next 10 years. But um, obviously that changes all the time. Funding level changes all the time as economic conditions change. Um, so um, we, we have done some work on that. Um, and we, we also review it every, every year with our actuary as well. Hi, uh, I'm, my name's Chris Hill. I was just picking that point up really in terms of that funding level. Um, two questions. One, how, you know, I've got no comparison in terms of how does 76% relate to other authorities. I think a couple of years ago you, you explained that. The second issue, I suppose, relates back to our current aim to be a commissioning council um, and the fact that we're likely to actually have less people technically working for Shropshire Council. Does that, will that not have an impact in terms of your benefit levels and if there were a whole load of people that were actually going to go, whether that would then have an impact and whether you're going to be able to pay all of that. Um, <coughs> if I pick that one up. Um, in relation to the, uh, uh, the, the, the valuation level for, for Shropshire compared to others, um, th this, is, this is part of the, the, the work that's being done in relation to uh, across the country to, to be able to compare uh, the way in which that funding, those funding levels sit. The, the, the issue is, is that uh, different actuaries will have their own um, uh, way of, of, ca of calculating that, working with the, the individual authority. So while you can get comparisons nationally, um, there is an element of apples and pears within that, that comparison, and that's part of the work that's being done at the moment to try and get a much more um, comparable uh, level across those. Uh, Shropshire at 70, uh, 76 um, uh, percent, 81 percent, 86 percent, different levels over, over the years. Uh, we compare reasonably well. There are some much much lower than that. Uh, there are some that that, that, that are um, that are better, but um, that will you know that, that will continue to be to, to, to change um, and, uh, and and evolve. Um, sorry, just remind me what the second question was, just very briefly. It was about the um, the impact on if you if we're actually going to the commission authority. The commissioning authority, yeah. Um, as, as has been explained in, in, in the presentation, uh, there's, there's a lot of change within the, the, the makeup um, of the fund. So as uh, individual schools, for example, move into academies, that changes the number of, of em employers. As um, a commissioning council is developed for um, Shropshire, and, and obviously Telvin Reekin or another major employer um, within this, uh, as as the uh, the model changes, there is the, um, the the potential for those numbers of employers to, uh, to change. The, the the they are two separate issues in a sense in relation to you have your active members making a contribution, which is um, appropriate to ensure that they are funded, um, but then you also have. Um, uh, that you, you then have those alternative employers and what, uh, the way in which they contribute, and you have the deficit recovery, which is a separate calculation to identify how much, at the moment, the local authority is putting in to ensure that the, 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 the scheme is funded uh, going forward and the, the values are there. So 
the, 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 the makeup of the membership may change, but what we will be doing is, in terms of that, um, the, the actual evaluations and the, and the makeup, we'll be taking that into consideration in all the calculations. So it, it will change, but we would hope to manage that impact. Um, we were told, I'd like to be reminded please, how the appointments are made to the uh, local pensions board. Um, you nominations from uh, the employers and various other sources, and you did tell us who actually selects the people from there. There's obviously no election process. Can you remind us again, please? Um, yeah, in, in, in terms of the, um, the, the, the appointment panel, um, we've identified that myself as the, uh, the, the local authority, Section 151 officer, um, and scheme administrator will be on that appointment panel, along with the monitoring officer for Shropshire Council, um, which is uh, uh, Claire Porter. So we would sit as the, uh, the appointment panel. There will be um, a selection process will, which will be identified so that we can demonstrate that we're going through an appropriate process uh, for that. So there will be uh, application forms. Those forms will then come in, be considered, sifted, taken through a process, and at the end of it, there will be um, appointments, uh, appointments made on that basis. Thank you. Uh, Richard Jones, this is a, a request really for Debbie to to be able to put the dates of the pension in January on the on the, the pension site so that we know the actual dates at the within that year that we're actually going to be paid. This really helps us to uh, we've got funds coming in or, or money or payments we've got to pay out to to be able to adjust it in time so that we know when our pension's coming in. Is that possible? I was going to say that it, it is usually an in touch, but I don't think we put the whole year. We may put the six months in, um, but we'll make sure it's more visible. Glenn Bryce, um, if I remember rightly from uh, some time a little while ago, the allocation of the fund uh, between equities and uh, bonds and so on carried something like three percent on infrastructure. I just wondered whether you had any detail of the actual infrastructure works that we were investing in. Yeah. One of the investments, only is 3% of our fund, with only 1% committed at the moment, and marks that 3%, but one of the infrastructure investments within that fund is Edinburgh Airport, so um, the pension fund is part owner of uh, Edinburgh Airport. Can I thank you very much for attending? It's been interesting, and I thank everyone for their presentation. That has been particularly interesting, and can I wish you, on behalf of everyone associated with the Pension Fund, but at this time of the year, when well, we were looking forward to Christmas, so hopefully you'll have a very good Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you very much.